The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. to start off with something that the Lord was speaking. Um, Dennis and I attended one of Sid Roth's tapings over at his building, and the Lord spoke something significant there. But then I looked in my journal, and he had already spoken it, and I'd written it down a day or two prior, that some um, 35 years ago or so when I was saved, before I even knew there was such a thing as a concordance or a way to look up Bible verses, um, the Lord gave me scriptures, Jeremiah 29, 13, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. And so all these years I've been seeking. Oh, oh. So I couldn't, I didn't know where that verse was, but I just heard it somewhere, and then I didn't know how to find it in the Bible. So I went out to the car, turned on the Christian radio, and somebody gave that verse and said said where I could find it. So that stayed with me all my years. It's my railroad track scripture that I always have written in the front of my Bible. And right down period, periodically when I'm in my prayer time, well, what the Lord said, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. What the Lord said, it's time to find. And that's not just a word for me. That's a word for where he is taking us. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly appear in his temple. So that is what we are anticipating happening in this place. And we've been doing a study on Ezekiel. And the points we're going to cover this morning, the title of the message is The Holy Building of God. The points we're going to cover is, number one, God's house. Number two, literal or spiritual? Three, details of the temple. Four, the altar at the center. Five, the river and trees. And six, the city and the land. So number one, God's house. Two, literal or spiritual. Three, details of the temple. Four, the altar at the center. Five, the river and the trees. Six, the city and the land. Now, Ezekiel can be differentiated into four sections. In the first section, which is chapter 1, we see the glory of God. In the second section, chapters 2 through 32, we see judgment on the children of Israel and on the nations. And by the way, the purpose of judgment is so God can recover. So God can bring back what is his, bring it back to himself. So the third section, 33 through, I don't have the chapters right here. Um, 33 through 39 is recovery by life. Recovery by God's life. And now we're at the fourth section, the whole purpose of it all. The whole reason that we've read all those chapters in Ezekiel, 
the fourth section is God's house, the church, God's building, God's house, God's temple. The fourth section is the purpose for everything that's gone before. Now, one thing that we mentioned about Ezekiel is that it's a miniature of the entire Bible. That the book of Genesis starts with the glory of God in a garden temple with man. God has always wanted to dwell with his children. The only thing is we have to line up with him for his presence to be there. So we start out with the glory of God in a garden and there's a river and then we read that they're building materials, precious stones in this garden. We come to the end of the Bible, to the book of Revelation, and what do we learn? We learn that these building materials, these precious living stones have been built together in a breathtakingly glorious city where God dwells with his children and God's children dwell with him. The same with Ezekiel. It begins with the glory and it ends with a house. Actually, a house, a city, and land. Now, when I was a little girl... I loved to go around with my dad. And he said he was a lawyer, but he said if he hadn't been a lawyer, he would have been an architect. So I cannot tell you how many building sites I have been on in my life and how many beautiful houses and buildings in Florida I went with my dad to see. Um, now, when I was in college, mom and dad built a house, and so I was there with you know, all the decisions, picking out wallpaper, light fixtures, you know, from the beginning of the building to the end of the building. And now my brother lives in that house and they still have the same wallpaper there that I picked out. So, and as part of this learning about houses, I watched a series that started in 1979. It's still going. It's called This Old House about renovations renovating these amazingly gorgeous historic homes and now of course we've got HGTV but it doesn't hold a candle to this old house in my book God is really serious about building Jesus said in Matthew 16 18 he said I will build my church so now in Ezekiel we've been getting ready life has been the dry bones have been formed into an amazing, living, exceedingly great army. And now this section tells us how Jesus builds his house. Ephesians 5.25 in the ERV version says, Jesus loved the church and gave his life for her. This is foremost on God's mind. Now, unfortunately, what we have in most of our local churches is piled up building materials. And the church is not supposed to be a hospital. The church is not just a, a club for people to come and hang out. That God wants to build a living organism in our churches. We mentioned before in the book, Reese Howell's Intercessor. In chapter five, we read how God visited Reese Howell's and made him a mighty man of God. But then we get over in chapters 30, 31, 32, and we read how the Spirit of God came upon his Bible college at Wales and made them into a living organism of intercessors to turn the tide of World War II. And it's a fascinating account of what was going on while our men were fighting so bravely, what God was doing with Hitler. So that's, that's very exciting to me. But God needed a living organism 
that would work together with him at his direction for a particular purpose. That is what our churches are supposed to be when Jesus does the building. What God does, he begins changing us. And we know we have flesh and then we have spirit. Well, Jesus doesn't build with our flesh. He builds only with the life that he's produced in us. And then we read in Ephesians that this living organism is held together by the bond of peace. Now, bond is actually the word for ligament that you would describe how bones are held together by ligaments so they can move together and move in unison. 1 Peter 2.5 says, We are living stones being built together for a spiritual house for God. The final section of Ezekiel about the holy building of God, the first three sections are for the last section. The eternal purpose of God has always been to have a building. Everything God does in the midst of his people is ultimately for his building. Now let's go back to the scripture. Ezekiel's vision at the beginning of this section. Ezekiel 40 verses 1 through 4. And by the way, um, we're, we're going to be covering this. To build something, you have to start with a plan. You have to start with a blueprint. Ezekiel 40, 1 through 4. So in the 25th year of our captivity, at the beginning of the year, on the 10th day of the month, in the 14th year after the destruction of Jerusalem, on the very same day, the hand of the Lord was upon me, and he took me there. In the visions of God, he took me into the land of Israel and set me on a very high mountain. On it toward the south was something like the structure of a city. He took me there, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of bronze. He had a line of flax and a measuring reed in his hand, and he stood in the gateway. And the man said to me, Son of man, look with your eyes and hear with your ears, and set your heart and mind on everything I show you. For you were brought here so that I might show these things. Declare all you see and you hear to the house of Israel. Now there was a wall all around the outside of the temple, and in the man's hand was a measuring rod, six cubits long, each being a cubit and a handbreadth. And then he went to the gateway which faced east, and he went up its stairs and measured the threshold of the gateway, wet gateway, which was one rod wide, and the other threshold was one rod wide, and each gate chamber was one rod long, one rod wide, and between the gate chambers was a space of five cubits. And then we get into the measuring. I read a book by an architect who had read the book of Ezekiel as a young boy before he was even saved. And he was completely befuddled with it. He could make no sense of it at all. And life happened. And he wandered far away from the church. God got a hold of him. And now he's written a book on Ezekiel from an architect's perspective. And it's a, it's a fascinating study to read. It was um, learned a lot from it, actually. So when did Ezekiel have this vision? We had his first vision we learned when he was 30 years old, which is the time for a priest to begin his ministry. And Ezekiel was a priest and a prophet. At the time of this vision, he's 50 years old, which is the 
retirement age for a priest. So some time took place from the beginning of Ezekiel's book to the very end. But this represents that maturity is needed to see what God wants, to see with God's heart what does God want in his house? How does Jesus want to build his church? We're told that Ezekiel saw the vision at the beginning of the year in the first month. This represents a new beginning, a new start. And it was also on the 10th day. The 10th day was when the people prepared the lamb for the Passover. So this signifies that the temple that Ezekiel sees is centered in the redemptive work of Jesus, our Passover lamb. Our Passover lamb, and we will learn that it's very significant what is found at the exact center of this great structure that Ezekiel saw. Now, in the first chapter of Ezekiel, he's in the land of captivity, but God changed his perspective and brought him for this final vision back to the land of Israel in the spirit and took him up on a high mountain, signifying resurrection life, ascension life. Now, the man with the measuring reed who's doing the measuring, of course, is Jesus. It's Jesus who builds. It's Jesus who measures and makes sure everything lines up. Now, um, I remember when our next door neighbor's house was being built, we had woods looking out my, outside my kitchen window. And all of a sudden, these trucks and equipment came in and ripped all the wooded area out that I'd so much enjoyed. And because there was a slope, I could look down on it. So I was able to watch the whole building process, which was uh, very interesting. This is significant that we knew the builder. The builder was the same builder who built our house 25 years ago. And so he kept close tabs on his work. He would come and supervise regularly and make sure things were being done just right. And <coughs> it reminds me of Jesus building his church. He is very exact, and um, he's the one who measures, and he is qualified to measure everything. And now he's measuring what is being assembled into his house. And this is very exciting because what the Lord spoke to me, it's time to find, which means we're going to find God and he's going to find us. And what Dennis got, it has begun. We're, we're at a very significant time. I believe that we are right before the Pentecostal outpouring on the Bible College of Wales that allowed them to be built together into a living organism. I believe it's a very significant time that we're in, and um, I have a lot of anticipation about what God is getting ready to do. Now, let's get into whether this is point to a literal or spiritual building. And a lot of people talk about Ezekiel's temple being built. One thing that we need to understand is that within the midst of Ezekiel's huge vision and walls and spacious um, layout that he had, we find Solomon's temple. But the rest of Ezekiel's vision is huge. So let's go over um, this Ezekiel's temple must be one of two things, a physical temple in the future or a symbolic spiritual temple. Temple. Now, problems with Ezekiel's temple being a literal physical building are these, and this is just a few of the problems. First of all, the fig physical size. The temple area would be so big, the temple... Um, compound would be so big it would cover all of ancient Jerusalem and be about three and a half square miles. 
I, those of you who've been to Israel, there is a um, layout, a model of Herod's temple and then Jerusalem. And the thing that stands out is that temple was huge. It dominated the entire city. But it's small compared to what Ezekiel saw. I mean, there wouldn't, everything that was originally there in the city would have to be gone for this to be built. And there's some other problems with separation and the city and the temple being separated, which would be impossible because the city and the temple are incorporated. Um, that's the location. Ezekiel's temple is said to be 500 reeds, about 10 miles north of the city. However, the city and temple were always joined together in the Bible, with the temple being inside the city. And in Ezekiel's vision, the new temple could not possibly be on either Mount Moriah or Mount Zion. And then we've got the problem of the river. To actually have a physical river flowing out from this temple would create all sorts of problems. The building materials, the problem with the building materials is no building materials or decorations or even the height of many things are even mentioned. You know how specific God was about the materials for the tabernacle of Moses and how it was to be built and every, every little detail. And then you get to Solomon's temple and it's almost overwhelming in its detail. There are no details. There's an architectural vacuum. It's nothing more. Ezekiel's temple, the way he describes the vision, is nothing more than a rough floor plan. I don't know if you've seen the blueprints for the actual building of a house. I mean, with pages and pages and pages of how everything is to be done. It's not just a floor plan. It has elevations of how things are supposed to look. and um, But this lacks all the essential details. Then the cubit used for measuring with the measuring reed is not the size of a physical cubit. And that indicates that the measurements were spiritual assessments and not actually measuring things out with the measuring tape. Also, what happened after Ezekiel was written? A remnant was brought back to Jerusalem. A wall around the city was rebuilt. And then Zerubbabel's temple, the second temple, was built. It didn't even remotely um, cover anything or utilize anything that was in Ezekiel's vision. I mean, Zerubbabel ignored Ezekiel. So that strongly indicates that it was not to be built into a physical building. So a lot of people talk about that it's going to be built in the millennium. Well, that is just a short list of some of the impossibilities. So fix it in your mind that this must be a spiritual assessment and not a physical assessment. Now, let's cover the details of Ezekiel's temple. Now, cover some size comparisons. Solomon's temple was approximately the size of two-thirds of a football field, an American football field. Ezekiel's temple compound was the size of 10 football fields. Huge building. And why is it huge? Why would Ezekiel, why would God show Ezekiel this huge temple? Because Jesus wants his church to be huge. Everyone is invited. A great king gave a feast and invited everyone to come. Jesus died, paid the price so that every single person who's ever lived or ever could live 
would be including included in his church. Jesus died for everyone. He made it available for everyone. He said, I am the door. All are welcome to come in. But not that many people pay attention to the invitation. And I know you've heard this said that why would a good God send people to hell? God doesn't send people to hell. They refuse the offer that he's made them. He wants everyone to come and all of his children, all human beings, to be brought into his house, his temple, his throne room. So the problem is, why are people so dumb that they refuse his invitation? I mean, seriously, that's... How could you overlook an invitation from the king to come feast in his royal banqueting hall? Now, Ezekiel's temple was surrounded, the compound was surrounded by four walls. Now, what do walls do? The walls of a house separate everything that's inside from everything outside. So, yes, Jesus is the wall. He is the dividing line that separates. You have to come to Jesus to come inside the wall. And if you don't come to Jesus, then you're excluded. Those who belong to Messiah are in, inside the walls. And those who are not his are separated out. But Jesus is not only the wall. He's the gate. There's six different gates in Ezekiel's temple. John 10, 7, Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. And in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I'm the way. I've made a way so you can come in. I've made an opening. Now, there's six gates found in the temple. Why six? Because six is the number of man. And Messiah is the perfect man. And he's the one who sets the standard. All things are measured by him. But God says, be holy for I am holy. Well, how can we do that? Because Jesus came to live inside us. And it's no longer I who live, but it's Messiah who lives in me. And the life that I now live, he lives through me. That's how we can line up and meet these spiritual specifications that are in Ezekiel. Now, when you read Ezekiel, of the several chapters that describe the, the temple and the different facets of the temple, one thing that you need to study, if you get down to it and actually study that part, you need to know that the numbers mentioned are very significant that all the numbers, all the things that are measured um, have a meaning. Number one is symbolic of unity. Number two, witness or testimony. Three speaks of the triune God. Our God is three in one. Number four speaks of the earth. Four directions, four seasons, four living creatures, that which comes from the earth. Number five is symbolic of grace. The tabernacle of Moses had five curtains, five pillars, five sockets, five bars, and the altar was five cubits by five cubits. Number six is humanity. Seven is spiritual perfection. Eight, new beginnings. Ten, government. Twelve, spiritual authority. You can find, um, you just do a, Google search num numbers in the Bible and you can get lists of these. And all the numbers that are mentioned are very specific in Ezekiel's temple. But and, and it is wonderful and complex to get into studying that. But anyway, y'all can look those up yourself. But in this temple, guess what? There are multiple kitchens and dining areas. Why? Because in God's temple, in God's house, we don't just come to 
study. We don't just come to hang out and have fellowship. We come to feast on Jesus, his presence for our enjoyment. And there are also chambers in Ezekiel's temple for singers and for worshiping. So we worship God for his enjoyment and we feast on him for our enjoyment. The chambers are for feasting and enjoying the Lord. He not only redeems us, but he nourishes us. We drink in. We talked um, some time back about how do we feast on the Lord. For one, when we read his word, we don't just read the words with our head. Drink in the anointing. You're feasting on Jesus. When we call on him during the day, just pay attention. Just think his name, Jesus, and notice the little joy bubble that you get. We need to be feasting on him by calling on his name all day long. Just just try. Give it a try. Whenever you think of his name, drink in. You're actually receiving spiritual nourishment for him, from him. And there's no limit on, don't you love it that there are no calories involved? <laughs> so we can feast on Jesus all day long, not just in our prayer time, but feast on him in reading the word, feast on him by drinking and breathing and eating him in. And in studying feasting on the Lord, there's really no difference spiritually between breathing him in, drinking him in, and feasting on him. So you can use those words interchangeably. Now, we are told that the people who come into the temple stand on stones. Ezekiel forty seventeen through 18. Then he brought me into the outer court, and there were chambers and a pavement made all around the court. Thirty chambers faced the pavement. The pavement was by the side of the gateways corresponding to the length of the gateways. The chambers for feasting on the Lord are paved with stones. The pavement separates us from the dirt of the earth. In the beginning, we were made of clay in the old cre as the old creation. We were made of the same nature as the earth. When we were saved, we became living stones and not just a little pebble, yet like you pick up um, from a stream bed. I'm talking diamonds and sapphires and rubies, precious stones that have been forged in the heat and the glory of God. Living stones. You might want to go read a little bit about the New Jerusalem and how beautiful and magnificent it is with all the beautiful colored stones. Guys, that's us. We are precious. We are not something common. To enjoy Messiah, we stand on the stones of regeneration, the new birth, our new nature. And by the way, we should stand on these stones all day long in our daily life. However, if we should get involved in worldly entertainment and activities, we're back standing on the dirt of the earth. So we need to be washed as Jesus washed the disciples' feet. We need to be washed. The dirt needs to be washed off of us regularly as we come in contact with the world. And we're going to come in contact with the world, so let's just not seek out the bad things of the world to participate in. Um, we should stay away from things that make us dirty. We should guard our eye gates, our ear gates, and our activities, and stand on the pavement of our new birth all the time. And then we're told that there were guard rooms in the temple. Ezekiel 40, verse 10 in the Amplified. And the guard rooms or lodges 
sometimes called gate chambers or little chambers of the east gateway, gateway were three on this side, three on that side. The three were the same size and the posts or jams were the same size on either side. Now, what are guard rooms? So you can get lost in the details of Ezekiel, but the most, the important part here is what are the guard rooms for? These are the rooms where the guards who protect the temple stay. These rooms represent the Lord Jesus as the guard of God's glory and holiness. The only ones who can enter the temple must match God's glory and holiness. When we pass through Messiah as our gate, this qualifies us to enter the building which is filled with God's glory and holiness. Now, Ezekiel's temple compound has a couple of axes. One is the east-west axis. You know, when in the second coming of Jesus, he will enter the city through the eastern gate. When the God's glory comes to Ezekiel's temple, it comes from the eastern gate across the compound. Now, the lay people and people who came in to feast and to worship came through the north-south axis. So what does this represent? God intersecting with his people. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And what is at the exact center, the intersection of these two axes? The altar representing the cross. The altar is at the exact center of Ezekiel's temple. The central matter of God's message for redemption is the altar which terminates the old creation and germinates, gives life to the new creation. It's the center of everything. As a matter of fact, it's the center of the universe. No matter which gate you take to enter into Ezekiel's temple, you must come to the altar. The altar is inescapable. It's unavoidable. It's at the center of the compound. It's the meeting place of God and man. And it's at this place that we die and he lives. When Jesus went to the cross, all human beings went to the cross. When Jesus was resurrected, we were res resurrected. When Jesus ascended, we ascended with him. Romans 6, 3, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Messiah Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism unto death, that just as Messiah was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And Ephesians 2, 4 through 6 People get ready. This is where we are right now. We're about to experience this. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6. God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive with Messiah and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Messiah Jesus, third level living, third level living. Now, chapters 41 and 42 of Ezekiel continue with the measuring. In chapter 43, the glory that Ezekiel saw at the beginning returns to the temple. Why? Because everything was lined up according to the standards of Jesus. Because, see, this was now a house built by Jesus. We want to be that house. He's working in us, and he's getting ready, and he's got the plans. He has the blueprints. He has all the specs ready. 
for what he is going to do in this place with this people as God fits us together, living stone, stone upon stone, built up into a holy habitation of God. Ezekiel 43, 1 through 12. Afterward, he brought me to the gate, the gate that faces toward the east, and behold, the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east. His voice was like the sound of many waters, and the earth shone with his glory. It was like the appearance of the vision which I saw, like the vision which I saw when I came to destroy the city. The visions were like the vision I saw by the river Kibar, and I fell on my face, and the glory of the Lord came into the temple by way of the gate which faces toward the east. The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Then I heard him speaking to me from the temple while a man stood beside me, and he said to me, Son of man, this is the place of my throne. And the place of the soles of my feet, where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. In verse 10, Son of man, describe the temple to the house of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure the pattern. And if they are ashamed of all that they have done, make known to them the design of the temple in its arrangement, its exits and entrances, the, its entire design and all its ordinances, write it down in their sight so that they may keep its whole design and all its ordinances and perform them. This is the law of the temple. The whole area surrounding the mountaintop is most holy. This is the law of the house. Well, the children of Israel, a small remnant, ended up going back to Israel, but they were not very good listeners. God had already warned Ezekiel, they're not going to listen to you. you mu- I need to strengthen you so that you'll be able to stand it. And they actually mocked Ezekiel, but it says that everything in Scripture was written for us today, for our teaching, for our instruction, for our encouragement in knowing what God is getting ready to do. Now chapter 44 describes the Zadok priest who draw near to the Lord. So we have a standard for the temple compound, and then we have a standard for the people. What will these people who line up with Jesus' standards, what will they look like? And... What great privilege will they have? The Zadok priesthood was made up of the ones who drew near to God and ministered to him. No separation, no outer court, no holy place, just the holy of holies for those who draw near. Ezekiel forty four fifteen through 16 But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, who kept charge of my sanctuary, when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to minister to me, and they shall stand before me to offer the fat and the blood, says the Lord God. They shall enter my sanctuary. They shall come near my table to minister to me, and they shall keep my charge. In 1 Peter 2.9, to us, You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This invitation is extended to all God's children, but we know that not everyone listens, but we are listening, Lord. We have the privilege of drawing near to the Lord as overcomers if we accept the invitation. Now chapter 45 speaks of the land for the city, the offerings, and the feasts. Chapter 46 continues along that vein. But then, what happens when the glory comes? And we have seen this vision here of the 
the river. We've actually seen water pouring out of this place because, see, God doesn't just want to stay confined. God doesn't want to just stay confined inside a building. God wants to flow out of our local churches and change the world, change our cities, change um, change our location. God wants to be able to reach everybody. One thing that I just particularly enjoy about the Gospel of John is Jesus, when he talked about, destroy this, this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And they were confused because they didn't know that he was talking about the temple of his body. You see, for thousands of years, God was at mo at best confined to a building. In the tabernacle in the wilderness, God was in the Holy of Holies. And now they did have a movable tabernacle. They carried it to different places, but God was still confined to the tabernacle. Then the Temple of Solomon, God was confined to the Holy of Holies. But now in Jesus, God was mobile. He could go throughout all, Jesus could go throughout all of Israel, speaking to people, healing people, casting out demons, raising people up healing the brokenhearted, ministering with com great compassion to the people. But then with the crucifixion, the enemy made his biggest mistake because when Jesus was crucified and resurrected and ascended, he came to dwell in the hearts of his people. Jesus was multiplied and enlarged so that wherever a believer goes, there's the temple of God. And it said when the veil in the temple was rent, the glory and the power of God came rushing out of the Holy of Holies in the temple. God didn't need to stay there anymore. So God wants to dwell in our house, yes, to have his house here, to make this place a habitation of God in the spirit. But he doesn't want to stay in here. He wants to get out into the Charlotte area and wherever you might go, that you'll carry the glory of God. And Dennis was talking about the next thing is presence evangelism. And that really came from a story about Charles Finney, um, the great evangelist who carried the presence of God so powerfully that he walked into a factory, didn't say a word. And the girls who were working there in that building started falling to their knees and saying, what must I do to be saved? There's another story about Charles Finney that he was on board a train. And there was a man sitting opposite him reading a newspaper. And the man lowered his newspaper and said, Sir, I don't know who you are, but your mere presence convicts me of sin. God wants us to be mobile temples and take him out and touch this area with his presence, with his glory, with his power, with his holiness. So Ezekiel 47, we come to the part about the river and the trees. Verses 1 through 12. Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the front of the temple faced east, and the water was flowing from under the right side of the temple south of the altar. He brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gateway that faces east, and there was water running out of the right side. Then the man, speaking of Jesus, the measurer, went to the east with a line in his hand and measured, and he brought me through the waters, and the water came up to my ankles. Again he measured. The water came up to my knees. Again he measured, and the water came up to my waist. Again he measured. And it was a river I could not cross, for the water was too deep. 
water in which one must swim, a river that could not be crossed. When I returned, there along the bank of the river were very many trees on one side and the other. And then he said to me, This water flows from the eastern region, goes down through the valley, and enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters will be healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves, wherever the rivers go, will live. There will be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters go there. For they will be healed, and everything will live wherever the river goes. Now Ezekiel spoke, spoke of two rivers. The first river, the river Kibar in the beginning was the place of captivity, signifying judgment. The second river, the river of life, was in the Holy Land, and it represents the supply of divine life. What produced this river? What made this river possible? The church, the house of God, was built up. The living stones were built together. The people were living according to the pattern and statutes in their daily lives. The priests, the serving ones, were serving God in a proper way. And everything was done according to the pattern given by the Lord. We give ourselves to God completely. God gives himself, his presence to us. And Jesus has a built together church. And then the final point is the city and the land. In Ezekiel 48, the land is divided up according to the tribes of Israel, but it represents how close or distant we are from the Lord. And we know we've had an invitation to come and minister in the presence of the Lord himself. This is how close we want to be to the Lord. But that depends on our heart and our willingness. Now, without the land, there can be no temple. But God also wants there to be a city. The temple represents the church. The land represents Messiah himself. The temple depends on the land, and without experiencing Messiah, it's impossible to have the church. Before we have the temple, we need the land. When all God's children come and join in with him, then we have a city. The church is not doctrine and ritual. It's experiencing the living Messiah. The recovery of the land represents our enjoyment of Messiah. To enjoy him, we must experience his presence. The children of Israel were promised a land flowing with milk and honey, and Jesus himself is our promised land. We have the mingling of God and man, the mingling of humanity with divinity. We have 12 as the perfect government. And the city that comes from this mingling will exercise the authority of God for the carrying out of his eternal plan in his kingdom. We will be, he will be our God, and we will be his people. A house for God, and when we began meeting here in this building back many years ago, the Lord gave us our instructions. He said, build Ephesians 2.22, build me a house. And that is what we are still doing. And now he says it's time to fight. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.